at this point, so nice to see you all again. Um, we'll get right into the fall crop trials. So I do three different uh, cuts on our hybrid rye, uh, food stage cut, uh, milk stage cut, and then I do an opportunity cut after or from regrowth on the food stage. And then on our triticalia, I do a milk stage and our winter wheat, I do soft dough cuts. So we'll get into each stage going forward, but um, so the boot stage cut this year was done on May 23rd. Um, this generally will be your best quality forage. Um, I did notice that the Serafino and the Performer, they were one of two days ahead for flowering. So um, it could be like a good good thing for you if you want to get into the field a little bit sooner. But um, then we'll, there's just a little bit of data from there. So the Serafino and the Performer, since they're a little bit ahead, they performed a little bit better. And I'll get into the milk stage cut. So um, this one will generate your most tonnage. This is what typically all you guys are doing for your hybrid rise. But this one was done on June 23rd. Um, the hybrid rise were two days ahead of the tedious. So the triticale, um, it was pretty close for timing wise, which can be a really good thing for if you want to test out some tedious triticale. Then there's some data from it. So a little bit of yield data. Um, then a little bit of uh, TDN content as well. So um, if you guys want this data, it's, it is on our website, but if you want it uh, printed out, just let me know and I can get that to you. And then yeah, this opportunity cut. So um, the, the regrowth from the boot stage cut generally will um, give you about 60 to 70 percent of what you got for tonnage on your boot stage cut so um, if if you have that opportunity it can be a good option but generally this may not work for most producers so and then the winter wheat would so that was taken on July 19th um, so just about two months after and then the winter wheat so our wildfire and our cold front they were taken off on July 7th and they tested pretty well, but um, I wouldn't, I can't guarantee 20 metric ton, but you never know. <laughs> All right, so here's just a picture of our, our fall crop trials this year. Next, we'll get into the my double cropping experiments. So I did a little test on oats and forage sorghum just as a head-to-head -head to see what could work for uh, as an option for some for guys that are want to do the double cropping. Um, oats they generally are going to come off sooner, so if time timing is an issue, um, that's going to be your best option. Um, but sorghum, if you're allowed or if you can let it sit in the field a little bit longer, you're going to generate some real good tonnage. So um, these plots were planted on June 2nd, which would be timing after the boot stage cut. Um, and that's generally why the harvest dates are a little bit sooner than what you would from a milk stage. But um, timing for this, after double cropping, yet earlier is always better. I mean, um, as soon as you can get your rye off, give it some time and then get the, the oats or sorghum in right after. Um, the oats, sorghum is a good one to have for, maybe if you have the option for um, grazing in the fall, it does stand well. It's so, if you get early, fall, no, early, early snowfall, all that sort of stuff, it will stand through it just like corn does, so you can graze through that. Or you can take it off afterwards for swath grazing. So um, here's kind of a time uh, lapse photos of the plots that I did. A few more but you couldn't all fit on the slide here so um on july 14th so that's just over a month you got in some good good growth there the oats came in a little later but they came in pretty strong so um on the sorghum i planted a little heavier on on these than you generally would on the on your production field you're shooting for 10 to 12 pounds per acre for your seeding rate so it's not a lot of product going down but um, these ones, it, you can tell that the sides, they ended up getting a little bit taller than the middles there, just for that reason. 
Then here's a field that actually got planted this year after it had to dry. So um, this producer ended up swath grazing it, still has cows in it. They've been in there for a month and a half now and he's he sectioned it off. So um, I think he's still on his second section. So he's, he's getting some good um, good head days out of it. So um, he went at 12 pounds per acre on this. All right, so then we'll get into the, there's a lot of information on the spring crop trials here. We had a lot of products um, in our spring crops. We had 14 different barleys, uh, three soft wheats and five uh, triticales. Then we had a mix of, we blended products as well. We blended the barley and then we blended the soft wheats and trits just to see as a comparison. Start off with the barleys. You can see there's a, a little bit all over the place. Our, our plots, they got sprayed a little late with the PGR, so they were a little stunted. Um, but still some uh, decent numbers to show the comparison there. Like uh, Generally this Sirisha as might be a little bit higher. They just got a little bit hurt on it, but uh, A.B. Hag did uh, win this one for this year. I think it came out just over 15 metric ton per acre. Then we'll get into soft weeds. So um, soft weeds and trip. And soft weeds, awesome, came out on top on that. Um, these were also kind of stunted, and I took these a little late. Um, Summer holidays got in the middle of all of everything. So, um, but the uh, overall, they all showed well. They had some experimentals in there from the field uh, crop development center. So those are the, the number of varieties, but um, overall the sun ray kind of came out for certified varieties. And then we didn't have a uh, surge trip. So uh, in our plots this year, that one, it's gonna be in the plots next year. It's gonna be exciting for forage. Greg will talk about it more after. Then we'll get into some corn silage trials. So I, I had four throughout Southern Alberta this year. Uh, two made it to data, um, and then two had some issues with them, uh, pivot issues and just timing on the other one, so it didn't work, quite work out. But the, the one on the left, that one was uh, Selta Tabor, and um, had three different companies in there. It showed really, really well comparative. Um, the uh, 4386, which is a, uh, HDRR high digestibility product. Um, generally, you're planting at a lower plant population. I'll we'll go into that after, but it uh, got second by a narrow margin there, so showed really well. And then on the right side, there's the uh, uh, corn trials east of Coldale there. So um, this one, year after year, it's a really good trial to be in. Um, a lot of good numbers, a lot of high numbers in this one this year. Uh, no, Byron are probably pretty happy with that, but um, the uh, 61 EE, it, it showed really well in this and excited about that product for Southern Alberta going forward. Here's some pictures of the plots throughout the year. On the far, on your far left there, you got the 6180. In the middle, you have the 4386. And on the right, you have the 4076. So 4076 is the HDRR2, but it doesn't need to have a lower plant pop compared to the 4386. They, um, the reason why the 4386 is a lower plant pop is it's called a leafy product. So um, it's a non-fixed year, so you need to give it a little bit of room to grow. And then this one actually just came off, but um, the uh, grain trial is a part of this year is Celta Tabor as well in the same field as my silage trial there. Um, it, these, that one was hard, uh, put in on May 18th and we harvested it on November 21st. So um, moistures came off a little lower um, than what you're shooting for, but overall that's, that's not a bad thing. You'd rather be a little bit too low than uh, Little, little high, but um, 62.78, it's a strong dual purpose product. Um, showed really well in here. It stands really, really well. And I think it has a real good suit for Southern over to here for if you're interested in growing, doing some green corn, you already are, but. So then, yeah, so I did 
figured I'd um, kind of highlight my four products that I'd be talk, uh, thinking that would be great for this area for 2024. So 6180, which I kind of went through, great for silage. 4072, it's, um, it's a non-refuge product as a 6072. It's uh, 72 day corn, so a um, little earlier for some guys, but it can be uh, show really good tonnage if you're willing to take it off a little earlier. And then you have 4386, which um, I already went into a little bit, but yeah, no, it's it's a really tall plant, really good standability on it, and overall, I think it's gonna have some good success success in this area. And then 6278, I think it's a dual purpose product, but I think it's more on the grain side for some Alberta for sure. Now get into a little bit of mustard here. Um, so we carry a broad. Uh, or, um, I guess a lot of different varieties. So for the brown, we have the hybrid brown 18, and then we have Centennial for conventional. Um, yellow, we have the yellow 80. Um, that one, ten, you're expected about 10% higher yield than the Andante. And then on the Orientals, we have the Cutlass, Vulcan, and Forge. So those are a little bit more of a niche market, the Orientals, but um, definitely have the product available. The seed is available in 50 pound bags, 1100 pound totes, and 2200 pound totes. Um, seed treatment op options this year are Helix Vibrance and then Helix Vibrance and Fortenza Advance for a little bit extra fleet beetle protection. And then I just want to highlight a little bit of canola. So we uh, represent Cantera Canola here and they came out with a new TrueFlex variety this year, uh, 3200. Um, nice uh, ex, uh, straight cut potential on it. So it is a soft release, so won't be able to maybe do a whole field with it, but you can maybe try some of it. Um, and you have the 3000 uh, series, so it's got excellent yield potential on it. Um, 3100, so that's a long season, but that's good for most areas here down uh, in the south. Um, maybe not a little bit further west, but, and then you have the Liberty Link 4000. So that one, um, great lodging under high management, um, great yields this past year, so excited about those. Here's a picture of the 4000. Then last I'll get into uh, cover crop benefits. So, um, and a little bit of forages as well. The some producers, what they've seen from, like we represent Imperial Seed here. Uh, they have a lot of different options for cover crops. It, they have uh, custom blends for grazing and or soil health. So like the potential that you can see from it is grazing options, um, can help with your soil health, uh, compacted soils with radishes and turnips. Um, and then we also have our, our fall rye, growers who have spread fall rye on there potato hills in the fall and gain speed in the spring when they're power hilling. Um, so yeah, there's lots of options for if you're interested in cover crops to seed from early spring to late fall. Now on the forage side, um, AEC Truman, so it's a great alfalfa for this area. It's good drought tolerance and can handle some uh, higher moisture as well. So suited for pivots and dry land sake. And um, then here's some of the custom blends that they can do. These are kind of the most popular for their their side of things. There's some more niche ones, but these would be the ones to kind of go to if you're just looking for some. So um, the TG Extend, you can see it late spring. Um, Soil Enhancer, it's gonna help build that nitrogen if you're looking to that, do that, plus you can get some grazing out of it. So that one you see late summer. Um, and then fall grazing, fall grazer, it is, uh, it's a midsummer seed and gives you a lot of great uh, grazing option into later fall. So I think that it, there's some pictures of cover crop from a couple years ago, I think. But and that's it. So any questions? I went through that pretty fast, <laughs> but <laughs> corn, forage trials, yeah. mustards, cover crops. Any questions on there? Maybe I'll get started on a call. Oh, yeah. yeah. How much nitrogen do you put on your sorghum? On that, on our my trial this year is just on the the fox. I think we had two hundred pounds of actual N, but um, generally, like, 
I'd probably say you need around 150 pounds uh, for good sorghum. Like it's it the forage sorghum variety. It's an 84 day, so it's not gonna be a full season um, like corn, let's say. So, but I'd say to generally get a good tonnage out of it, you're gonna need about 150 pounds. Yeah, if like in our demo plot there, then we had just spread in the springtime, or was it even the fall? Might have been the fall. I'd have to think now. Yeah. I think it was the spring it got spread on and on that plot, and that sorghum would have got planted a few weeks later. So it would have got similar fertility to our rise and winter yeah. wheat and our triticale field. So probably on the higher end, I would assume, of what, what most people would be doing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, um, what are your thoughts on year to year? Like last year, we, we had the so this year the winter wheat did really well in our forage trials. Yep, yep. Last year it was the, the triticale did really well and typically the rye is always really, really consistent. consistent. And the winter wheat, you know, it's always late for silage, yep. uh, whereas the rye is early. And then the trend, I was surprised, uh, only two days kind of to heading, or it's yep. to milk. Yeah. It was to milk, right? That was to milk, yeah. Yeah, so yep. only two days behind the rye to milk. So I was surprised how fast that triticale moved actually, so. Yeah. Any comments on, on how people are seeing that? Or? for timing wise yeah. and so yeah it's generally like your hybrid riser um they're going to be your earliest so it gives you that option for double cropping but it also gives you flexibility if you are getting into other silage timings like soft wheat or barley so they, you can kind of get going on that and get into your other products whereas winter wheat it's going to be in the midst of all that so it gives you options but um if depending on what your rotations are like. Um, quality, it can depend on product as well. It's hybrid rye, it's very good. All three are really good for quality, but it's all what you're kind of feeding at the end of the day, so. Um, did you try any Camarina on the double crop at all? I did not, no, no. Mm. Maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it would mature the Camarina? Or, yeah, the, yeah, the question is Camelina. Camelina, yeah. yeah. If you get it off on early enough, you'll probably get two crops out of the double crop. Okay. I know they're doing a little more in the south, but I haven't done it yet. Okay. Any other questions? That was Camelina, right? Yeah. You know, we do have stuff here, you know, in a place to go to the lake. And it seems like an old I'm driving and hooks up and cut it in it. Seven years out of ten, you don't meet your cost. Mm -hmm. I have to do something else. Maybe Camelina. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, and I think dry land, I mean, what most of what Blair was talking about today was irrigation. Yeah. So the challenge of dry land on double cropping, that's kind of probably not a not a thing. No. Um, we're just lucky to get one crop maybe <laughs> uh, on, on dry land. Um, but for, for us on like on our dry land, it's like with mustard prices being where they're at. I mean, if you've got fields that haven't had canola for five years, I mean, the mustard prices are still pretty strong. So it's probably another mustard year for a lot of people. Um, but for us on dry land, it's been kind of durum, a pulse, maybe a pea or a lentil, and, and mustard. But with mustard prices where they're at, it probably makes sense to load up on mustard a little bit. And when we collapse that market because we all grow too much, uh, then we'll switch it out to something else. <laughs> but the fall rise have done pretty well on, on dry land. But, um, and even that year where the rain came late, it retillered, and most half of our crop was in the tillers that came later that were then taller than the rest of the crop. So, pretty versatile crop on, on dry land, actually. Yeah? Do you have any Canadian data on the hybrid rice? Yes. Yes, yeah. that'll be in my presentation. Yeah. Anything else for Blair? Awesome. Well, okay. thanks, everyone. Okay. If you have any questions throughout the day, just come find me and I'll. Answer to my best of my ability.